The Taliban's security nightmare. The Islamic State in Afghanistan has claimed a bomb attack against the Hazara minority. As it's struggling to win international recognition, can the Taliban alone take on the threat of armed groups in the country? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. ISIL in Afghanistan has claimed responsibility for a suicide bomb attack on Friday in the northern city of Kunduz. Dozens of people were killed and others injured by the explosion inside a crowded Shia mosque during Friday prayers. It's the latest in a series of attacks by the group. The violence poses a threat to the Taliban, who promised to establish security that the former government couldn't provide. It's also pledged to protect ethnic and religious minorities. Al Jazeera's Hashem al Hubara reports from Mazari Sharif. These are the moments after a bomb blast tore through a mosque packed with worshippers. Security officials say a suicide bomber managed to get inside before blowing himself up, killing and injuring scores of people. ISIL in Afghanistan has claimed responsibility. The mosque is in the town of Khanabad in Kunduz city that's home to many members of the Shia Hazara minority. It was around 1.40 p.m. All the Muslims had gathered in the mosque for Friday prayers and then I heard the explosion. I was nearby and what I saw was just like the end of the world. Why is this happening to the Muslims? Which religion should we adopt where there's nothing like this and killing Muslims is forbidden? Believe God, I can't even talk anymore. I can't tell you how many dead bodies I've shifted in my vehicle. There was no ambulance. May God have mercy on all Muslims. It's one of the worst ISIL attacks since the Taliban takeover. As foreign forces were leaving in late August, the armed group also claimed responsibility for a suicide bombing at Kabul airport. More than 183 people were killed including 13 U.S. soldiers. ISIL later said it was behind a series of attacks targeting the Taliban in Jalalabad and Kabul. The Taliban launched a crackdown and arrested dozens of ISIL fighters in those cities. Taliban officials say they are determined to eradicate their rivals. Violence has increased over the last few days. The Taliban's next move is going to be closely monitored by the Afghan people and the international community. The United States is expecting the Taliban to deliver on a promise made in the 2020 Doha Agreement to prevent ISIL from building a base in Afghanistan. The blast in Kunduz underscores the growing challenges the Taliban now faces. Since it took over the country in August, the Taliban prides itself on providing a secure and stable environment. But the attacks in Jalalabad, Kabul, and now this one in Kunduz will increase anxieties among the Afghan people. Hashim al Al Jazeera, Mazari Sharif. Well, the armed group calls itself Islamic State Khorasan Province, a historical region that includes Afghanistan and other Central Asian countries. It was formed in 2014 by breakaway fighters from the Pakistani and Afghan Taliban groups. They pledged allegiance to the late ISIL leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. They're responsible for some of the worst attacks in Afghanistan and Pakistan in recent years, killing people in mosques, in public squares, and even a maternity ward in Kabul. The adversaries of the Taliban, ISIL has been highly critical of the Taliban's peace talks and engagement with Washington. ISIL strictly opposes the Taliban's goal of establishing an Islamic emirate within Afghan borders and instead seeks to create a pan-Islamic caliphate. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. Faiz Zaland is Professor of Political Science at Kabul University. He joins us now from Kabul. Michael Semple, Chair at the Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice at Queen's University, Belfast. He joins us live uh, via Skype from Dublin. And joining us here in Doha is independent Afghan analyst Hashmat uh, Mosli. Uh, good to have you with us, gentlemen. Michael, if we can start uh, with you. Before we can discuss whether the Taliban uh, can deal with the threat 
of ISIL in Afghanistan. We need to establish the, the nature of that threat and just how dangerous it is to the Taliban and the people of Afghanistan. How strong a force is ISIL in Afghanistan? What does it want? Where does it get its weapons, its money? And why is it targeting Afghans' Shia minority? The Taliban regime faces what we could think of as a threat from the left and the threat from the right. The threat from the right is a threat from ISIS. The Taliban can uh, take it extremely seriously. Although ISIS doesn't actually control tracts of territory, it has pockets of support around the country. It has a very effective uh, propaganda operation. Uh, it's good at operating undercover. Uh, it really terrifies Taliban officials because it has been the most effective organization at carrying out assassinations against them. They uh, they really posed they've posed as a sort of they. Um, uh, the, you know, the jihadi organization for jihadis who consider that the Taliban are far too moderate. They, uh, their move against Afghan Shias, I think, really is a way of sort of like staking out their claim to be um, you know, an organization which is not tempered by the certain amount of moderate, you know, moderation and, uh, and pragmatism which the Taliban have had to, um, have had to embrace. Um, ISIS say that they um, that the Shias are you know are heretics, uh, and they back that out with these kind of you know devastating symbolic attacks uh, against them. Uh, I think what the the Taliban are really worried is that uh, you know, uh, that ISIS can take away support from them, uh, and that. Uh, fighters who previously you know, aligned with the Taliban ultimately, if they don't get what they, they uh, want in terms of um, this is the Taliban regime, that they will end up shifting their support to ISIS. So, in a sense, the Taliban find themselves in a, a dilemma a little bit similar to the one that the Afghan government felt. The Afghan government never really felt that they were going to lose in a direct military conflict with the, with the Taliban. They um, they lost when their forces just disappeared and um, uh, melted away. Way, the Taliban are really concerned that their fighters could actually go over to ISIS. Hashman, I saw you nodding in agreement there. Um, uh, we, we still haven't addressed where ISIL gets its, its financing, uh, where it gets its weapons from. How, how big a threat to the Taliban are they? Well, uh, I agree with uh, almost all the points uh, made, uh, but uh, the, the biggest uh, crisis and the challenge facing the Islamic Emirate of the Taliban, more so than the, than the ISIS uh, weapons and, and their finances, is the, is the issue of legitimacy. The Taliban are now stuck between the struggle of uh, Islam versus liberalism. And uh, the Taliban movement has to find a balancing act has to find a way, a narrative and a practice that would both satisfy their hardline supporters and also satisfy the hardline liberals of the Western governments that would then open up the path for the Taliban to get international support. Uh, what makes this balancing act much more difficult, as I said, is the issue of the hardliners on the both sides of the spectrum. The, the question is to what extent the Taliban can uh, soften uh, their, their position and as, as our colleague said, moderate or keep on moderating their position to the uh, Western narrative of global and social and political order. Uh, as for the Taliban uh, or, or as for the ISIS, where they get their weapons from, uh, predominantly they will get their weapons from uh, the time when they, uh, when they start fighting the Afghan government, taking out a small units and getting weapons. Uh, remember, in the time of the war of Taliban against the Afghan government in the past, uh, a lot of sub weapons came into Afghanistan from Pakistan. The region was always awash with weapons. So a small arms uh, that, that the ISIS has came from there. But predominantly what makes the ISIS or made the Taliban more lethal in the past is their ability to manufacture uh, IEDs, uh, improvised uh, explosive devices, and the bombs that they, uh, that they manufacture and place them in the cars or trucks and blow them in areas uh, that would create instability for whoever is ruling. And the fact that the Taliban, or the fact that ISIS at the moment is targeting uh, the Shia community in Afghanistan, it goes back uh, to the war in uh, Iraq and Syria, where the Fatimiyun, uh, the Shia brigade that was created from the Shias of Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and all over the world. And to some extent, governments of the regions turned a blind eye to the Iranian recruitment of the Shias from Afghanistan. So now the ISIS in Afghanistan 
is basically going uh, after revenge, attacking those communities. And in that process, unfortunately, a lot of the innocent people okay. and bystanders get killed. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's bring in uh, Professor Dalan then. Um, can the Taliban crush its, its adversaries in Afghanistan or does it face an ongoing war of attrition? Uh, thanks for having me. I think uh, what we are discussing, it is uh, not uh, uh, a confined uh, uh, instability or uh, insecurity uh, to Afga Afghanistan and to Afghans as a geography or as a uh, population. Uh, ISIS and many other uh, uh, related uh, organizations, they have a globalized agenda. Uh, ISIS itself is uh, an imported or uh, uh, taken out of the its main core, uh, Syria uh, and uh, Iraq, from uh, an ideological uh, war and resistance from that region. So uh, fighting ISIS and fighting many others uh, uh, will require to Taliban an international and regional support. Uh, it should be, uh, uh, it should be uh, uh, fight and it should be contained by all the regional countries for the stability of the region. Uh, you know, uh, better that uh, Khorasan doesn't mean Afghanistan. It includes uh, parts of Pakistan, Iran, uh, India, even and uh, the whole subcontinent. So uh, what we are uh, uh, discussing, it is uh, actually a spillover insecurity uh, from the region to Afghanistan. And it requires regional and international uh, support to Taliban to uh, contain, fight and eliminate uh, such threats. Michael, uh, picking up on, on what, what Face was saying there, and Hashmat uh, uh, before him about um, uh, this balancing act between hardliners and liberals and its legitimacy, um, will the international community step in to assist uh, as far as security is concerned? Is it under any obligation to do so? The answer as of now is no. It is inconceivable that there would be serious, respectable international support for the, the Taliban in tackling their security challenges, which, of course, are not just ISIS. I mean, they're fighting their other enemies as well. This is the, the remnants of the old government. This is the representatives of the minorities. So at the, in the present time, present circumstances, are absolutely no. Uh, and the Taliban will not be surprised uh, with that, after all, there was a fully functioning security apparatus in the uh, uh, in the country, uh, which had received massive amounts of assistance, perhaps too much. Um, the Taliban saw fit to topple that. Uh, I think everybody who previously supported that, they're still licking their wounds. I think most Afghans also believe that what we see in Kabul, in the current sort of shape of the uh, the Islamic Emirate is not the end of the story. They really are going to have to make some adjustments to, uh, and to incorporate the rest of Afghan society, which has never supported the Taliban. So in the short run, no. But in the long run, of course, these things are going to have to be addressed because, you know, the, uh, ISIS... Uh, and basically, you know, the threat of chaos inside Afghanistan doesn't just threaten Afghanistan, it threatens the broader region and as far as Europe. So I think we're going to have to see some political movement, which the Taliban are very reluctant to do. They've, they, they always love to hold out and avoid compromise. But ultimately, we're going to see some political movement uh, from the Taliban side, some accommodation with the rest of Afghan society. And these will be the key to opening up uh, security assistance and also broader economic assistance. So, you know, we're, you know, we're at the start of the story, not the end of it. Uh, Hashmat, if uh, 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 international security assistance is provided, uh, um, what exactly would it entail, do you think? Uh, here is a conundrum. If the international community goes on to support the Taliban, ISIS will say Taliban are the stooges of the Americans and the Western powers. And that will empower ISIS in its propaganda war to win over the youth, especially from other minorities that right now the Taliban, the current government of the Taliban has sidelined. So there is a potential for recruitment from all other ethnic groups. I am a Tajik, I'm in contact with the Tajiks and a lot of the Tajik youth uh, are saying could ISIS be an alternative to fight the Taliban because we are left in the middle of, uh, of, of, of a global game? So if the international community does not support the Taliban and the Taliban government starts to become weakened, then ISIS propaganda machine is going to say, did we not tell you that statism or this concept of nation state does not work, that we have to go into a global jihad to create a khilafah that is 
so large and so big and has all the uh, resources and the population that can sustain itself economically. So these are the debates among the Islamist groups. But when I listen to the Western analysts, uh, the entire debate is reduced between uh, uh, moderation and between extreme uh, women rights and gay rights and uh, small minorities. These are not the issues that the Islamists are debating among themselves. At the moment, the debate is, does nation state work? Is there any nation state in the Muslim world that the Muslims can be proud of since the end of Khilafah? There isn't, according to their uh, narrative. And the Taliban have come into the fray saying, we are going to create an emirate again within the boundaries of, a, of a in international laws. And ISIS saying international laws are made to serve the hegemony or the hegemony of the uh, Western powers. And we have to break that. And this is where the Taliban have to find a narrative, how to create an Islamic uh, state or uh, emirate within the existing boundaries and implement their understanding of Sharia and how to bring the Western and, and the global community to help them economically. And there's a stalemate here. And the only beneficiary in this stalemate, as far as I can see in the long run and short term, is ISIS or the Islamic State, as we know it, or some call it Daesh. Faiz, what's, what's your uh, view on that? If uh, the international community were to, its, to assist with security in, in Afghanistan, um, would it even mean boots on, 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 the, on the ground? Um, would it be technical existence, for example? If, if there were forces sent in again to Afghanistan to help prop up the Taliban, to what extent could they find themselves just embroiled in the, in the same kind of never-ending conflict that, that bogged down mm -hmm. US and NATO forces for so long and, and Soviet ones before that? I think boots on the ground is not a, a, a clever solution to what's going to happen in Afghanistan in coming months. Uh, insecurity in Afghanistan, first of all, it's uh, uh, Afghanistan's issue. The government or the current government of Afghanistan must uh, reply to that. They must uh, have a, a, a rule in law and uh, uh, they must uh, show the power, uh, the monopoly of using the power in uh, their ge geography or uh, uh, present the sovereignty of the country uh, to the uh, rest of the world. Secondly, uh, getting back uh, any forces uh, from the region, from uh, Russia or from uh, NATO forces, uh, that will escalate the current uh, inst uh, instability and insecurity. It will attract more recruitment, not only to uh, Daesh or ISIS, but also to other powers who are anti-US uh, or any other foreign countries' uh, uh, presence, military presence in the, uh, on the ground. Thirdly, which is very most important, I think uh, we uh, went through a military uh, conflict, we went through war. Uh, currently, we need to uh, work on the political settlements. Uh, uh, Taliban must uh, attract more inclusivity to their uh, government, to their uh, political structure. Uh, the region must uh, support Taliban with the poorest uh, uh, borders that we have with Iran, we have with uh, Pakistan and uh, Central Asian countries uh, to uh, eliminate the cross-border uh, terrorism and also uh, sales of those that they are uh, separatists or they are uh, uh, having uh, ideological uh, confrontation with the regional uh, uh, countries. Uh, mm -hmm. third, uh, third very main important thing is for the European countries and the uh, US, they have left Afghanistan an unstable situation. They left Afghanistan facing so many uh, different uh, troubles yeah. like uh, poverty, uh, not having jobs uh, and uh, uh, weak uh, governance. So they need to support uh, okay. the new government yeah. in the transition uh, to be stable more fight such kind of controversies. Faith, it's that very point that I want to put to to, uh, to Michael. Uh, you said, Michael, that, that eventually some sort of international assistance will be given security-wise to, to the Taliban. But to what extent is, is time of the essence, given uh, the state in which Afghanistan uh, was left, um, and, and not sort of waiting until the Taliban has met the West's expectations of it concerning human rights and, and women's rights and all of the other things that, 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 that they're expecting from the Taliban. The security situation is deteriorating now. 
Well, that's, this is exactly the dilemma, but I think this is the kind of message which the Taliban are going to be getting loud and clear, and they're going to wrestle with how quickly will they be, be prepared to to move to accommodate not demands, not, not just you know, demands being forced on them by the West. Uh, remember that the the move that the Taliban made you know, into Kabul uh, was something which they decided on. Uh, they had you know no backing from the Afghan people for this. That they what they've done in the two months that they've been there is that they've divided the spoils exclusively uh, you know, within their own movement. They uh, they promised an inclusive government. They didn't deliver on it. So they shouldn't be surprised when they sit down with Western interlocutors who are all all keen to undertake preliminary engagement with them and are basically telling them there is a long list of things you're going to have to do before you do get serious assistance. In the meantime, what they're going to be offered is humanitarian assistance for the population rather than either security assistance or serious economic assistance. And the question is, how quickly can both the Taliban and also other Afghans, because remember, you know, Taliban only represent a small part of Afghan society. Taliban and other Afghans, as they get themselves organized again, how quickly that can they move towards some kind of credible structure, the actual inclusive government which the Taliban promised but did not deliver, because you know, that, that is when there will be a realistic prospect of proper security assistance and economic assistance. And the longer it takes, the more damage that will be done in the meantime, because you're absolutely right, Daesh are recruiting as we talk. Hashmat, the Taliban of the US are currently holding talks in, in Doha, ostensibly about uh, getting at-risk people out of, uh, of Afghanistan. The US, of course, wants assurances on uh, women's rights and, and education. What will the Taliban want, though, from those talks uh, in return? And, and will security assistance factor into that, do you think? Uh, uh, yes, uh, for sure. Uh, the, the Taliban would want uh, the American embassy to open for the American government to uh, uh, tell its allies in the region to normalize their relations with the Taliban and to start uh, giving Taliban more than just humanitarian support, that uh, start engaging with the Taliban at a very high level and uh, both political and economic uh, level, they need engagement and they need the money that has been frozen uh, in a World Bank to be released because Taliban really need that cash. But there's another angle here. Uh, I hear that a lot of the Taliban uh, leadership are turning again, blaming Europe and, and, and uh, speaking about the US support. But you can see that in the debate, uh, the organization of Islamic countries are completely uh, absent. And the Taliban are not asking the Muslim countries and Muslim uh, uh, states around the world to come to their support. And, and that in itself says a lot, that a lot of the governments in the region are not happy that Taliban have come to power because this model of a Sunni Islamist organization coming to power is seen as a threat by many of the so-called democracies and the kings in the region. And so a lot of the uh, governments around the region are very unhappy about the Taliban uh, assuming power in Kabul. So the Taliban problem uh, stems from, uh, as it was explained by uh, other, our other guests, that uh, they're not inclusive within the Afghan society. They are not liked within the region, except that Pakistan backs uh, the, the, the Taliban, uh, and China would like to have some type of relationship with them for their own, for its own political and uh, national benefits. And internationally, uh, you can see that the uh, Organization of Islamic Countries is staying away from the Taliban, EU is staying away from the Taliban, and overall United Nations is staying away, away from the Taliban. And the Taliban, in the meantime, are being uh, uh, pushed uh, around by uh, ISIS, saying that your model does not work, that we have to extend the fight to the other countries and, uh, and, and have a, a global agenda of, uh, of uh, jihad and establishment of a khilafah. And, and this is the, the problem the Taliban are grappling with. And I don't see any easy way out of it except the Taliban uh, making certain uh, concessions. But the real question is to what extent can the Taliban uh, change where they do not lose their core constituency, which are the hardliners. There are reports on social media, and I say this very quickly, there are uh, uh, videos on social uh, media where young Taliban fighters are saying, we are just waiting uh, for orders to go into Pakistan and blow ourselves up and commit uh, suicide bombing because we think that Pakistan government, government is not an Islamic uh, government. Okay. So uh, within the right. Taliban, there are that force that has similar ideas to that of ISIS. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Uh, Fez Zaland, Michael Semple and Hashmat uh, Mosley.
And thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can see the programme again at any time just by visiting the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, there's the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.